I'm John Batchelor, John Hemingway. His new book is In Full Flight, A Story of Africa and Atonement. This is the story, the biography of Je uh, Dr. Ann Spurry that she did not want written in her lifetime. She left us in 1999. John has been working on this book for more than 30 years. It's an exhaustive exp expedition into Africa, but also into the history of the 20th century. So let's begin with Ann Spurry's birth. She's born lucky on this planet. She's a Spurry. That is that she has a French and a Swiss passport. They have an estate in Switzerland. They have an estate in Alsace that goes back and forth between Germany and France for the last several hundred years. And they can summer on the Caribbean, on the Mediterranean. Her father, Henri Spurry, is the inheritor of an estate, a vast estate that still exists today. So she, he is also a veteran of Verdun. Does she remember her childhood as happy? Yes, I always thought she, she described it to me as very happy. Um, she had an older brother, six years older. Francois. Than her. Francois, yep. And, he, uh, and she adored him. She absolutely adored him. And she, she had two younger sisters. She, I, I have to say, she didn't really care a fig about them. Uh, she, um, she just avoided them. But they adored her. They celebrated her. Story. They celebrated her. They and they're still alive yes. today. Um, very elderly ladies, but they still talk about this extraordinary sister they had, who was so heroic. So uh, she grew up uh, with a rather domineering father, who um, was a scholar in his own right. They had strict orders at the table that uh, you didn't speak unless you really had something to say, and opinions didn't wasn't something to say. You had facts to uh, back up those opinions. Um, it was kind of a men's world. Um, Anne's mother, who she never talked about, uh, was also from a rich textile fortune. Schlumberger. Uh, Schlumberger, yes. And, uh, and she was uh, re relegated to a sort of a domestic uh, uh, role in the house. But Henri was in charge of everything. And... Um, he, her and, father, Henri, her father, the Verdun yeah, veteran. He, exactly. And by the way, um, in when you grew up in Alsace in those days, which was Mulhouse, uh, you were forced to learn German. Uh, but at French the French say Mulhouse, I say Mulhouse. Mulhouse, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I, I should and have we changed We go back that. and forth, back and forth. Yes, Alsace, yes. And uh, the uh, and so, but it, it, it there was strictly. There was a strict rule at the table, no German right. spoken. And that was, you know, an artifact of Verdun. Anne adored Francois for her whole life. Yeah. He was her touchstone. Right. Did Henri endorse, empower Francois? Did they have a good relationship? I believe so. I believe so. And um, it was so extreme, If it's almost hard to believe, but... Uh, she so wanted to emulate her brother that she dressed very much um, like a man. Right. And uh, when girls were always in dresses and pinafores and that sort of thing, not Anne. They called her a tomboy in French. Yeah, yeah. Uh, un garçon manqué. And, uh, the, the, um, uh, and if you look at photographs of her in this time, she was really quite handsome. And, uh, but petite. Ha petite. 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 And... Well constructed, um, Fair. but but you always saw her in uh, not blue jeans, but in khakis, and uh, uh, and and she looked like she could handle uh, small boat sailing very well. And she, I, I have pictures of her skiing. She was athletic and ha had adventurous. a lot of. She had a lot of friends. The other families, yeah. So they they summered in the Mediterranean. They were on Lake Zurich, the family estate. And they were also in uh, Manendorf, Manendorf, the yes. family estate. They had servants. They were extremely well-to-do. This is pre-war, pre right. uh, between the wars, the time between, between the war. I didn't hear a lot of politics except for the no Germans, right. which right. is striking. All right, let's get, quick, let's get to it. It's 1939. Anne is in Paris studying to be a doctor. Right. She sees the Germans coming to Paris. They all do. The right. government flees. Mm -hmm. 
hectic days. Francois sees it. They've been enjoying an apartment that, where they, their parents part, purchased for them. It sounds like a fabulous apartment. I imagine it's still in the family. But it's still there. I yes. drove by just the other day. And the Germans come in, and Anne, with other well-to-do young people, become the resistance. Does she make to do with that, why she did it. it. Was it to emulate Francois? Is that why she joined the resistance? That's really her motivation, mm -hmm. which is a little bit uh, strange because uh, if you read all those accounts by uh, young women at that time, some Americans, in fact, uh, they all joined the resistance because it was a, a matter of honor and they wanted to protect France and they wanted to uh, support the allies in every possible way. And did that, but I almost get the feeling that she did it as a secondary motive. So uh, she was, uh, uh, and her brother was in the resistance. Um, when he told her what, what he was doing and that his office in um, Aix-en-Provence was actually a front for the resistance, she immediately took the cue and she said, I'm, I'm with you. And she started a um, virtually a safe house in Paris in that wonderful place on the uh, Quai de Voltaire, overlooking the Louvre Fabulous and the Seine address. and so Fabulous forth. Fabulous yeah. address, right. And she becomes a courier and a safe house. Yeah. And the SOE, the special forces yeah. from the Great Britain, mm -hmm. they know her. She's in the, one of the, the cells in Paris, a vital right. cell. Right. And this goes on from 39 until 43. Right. Uh, so she's very successful at it. Yes. And then the crisis, as it must happen. Uh, the cell is broken, right. and they're arresting them. She does not flee. No, she's given a chance to flee. Yes, she is. And she explained it that she would have fleed, but she had to protect um, her her uh, confrères in the uh, resistance, and she had to get something out of her office in the hospital where she was working. So her father was there. He was prepared to take her to Switzerland, uh, where she would be safe, she would never see the war. Uh, and she said, give me a few hours. I'm on the way to the hospital. I'll meet you at the train station. Francois has been taken by this time. She knows that Francois has been taken? Uh, she, yeah. And that's yeah. the motivation. Right. She just heard that Francois has been taken. Right. And so uh, the last thing in the, in the world that the Spuries want is to see two of their kids taken. So they want to spirit her out of France, out of Paris. And so she dashes. And, right, she's caught, all right. The Gestapo have her, and they have a lot. There's, there's huge roundups going on right now. Yeah. And they're overwhelmed, and they take them to very famous prisons. The French use the same prisons. The Germans use the same prisons. Uh, at one point, isn't she in a, the same prison as Francois? They're, they're, yes. And he sends her some clothing items. Yeah. Uh, and is this, the, is this the kind of prison where they write on the wall, of the walls, uh, give my name to, and that sort of prison? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about it. That one is called Le Fren, but uh, she was taken when the Gestapo arrested her at um, Herald Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, she was taken to a place called Rue de Saucet, and Rue de Saucet was, uh, uh, I mean, it just sent chills through anybody in, in Paris in those days. I've come across it before in other stories. Yes. It, uh, yeah, I think it's... It, it's, it was a, a step to doom. It's, yes. it's just a terrifying place because it's where uh, Germans tortured, it's where they interrogated, and uh, there were little cubicles where they would just place you, and that's where these signatures were. Uh, so people were thinking that this was their last words, and they wrote them on the cell there, and uh, I believe some of them may still be there. Dr. Ann Spurry, she's not a doctor at this point, she's a medical student. Uh, member of the resistance for four years. She lived right. with this while Paris was being bombed, while the Allies are preparing uh, the Second Front, while the French, the Free French in, Fre in North Africa uh, have joined with the Allies to liberate France. All of this, she's waiting with well, all her, her compatriots, and yet now they're rolled up, and they're headed into the unknown, and the unknown is the nightmare. The book is in full flight, John Hemenway, Dr. Anshbury of Kenya, is the medical student in Paris. And between them is the 20th century's worst story. We'll tell it. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.